the church. Lovely to see you. Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus. And this Sunday uh, marks one full term since we've resumed this particular congregation. Uh, we've resumed the 8 o'clock congregation on the last Sunday of the last school holidays. This is the first Sunday of the next school holidays. And so we have resumed for a whole term, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, welcome again. If you're watching on church online, then welcome to you as well. We do hope that you'll enjoy hearing from God's word and that you'll be sharing God's word with those around about you. Uh, today we have the uh, privilege and pleasure of hearing from our student minister, Adam Johnson, who will be bringing us our last sermon in our series on Jesus' last words from John's Gospel, uh, as Adam preaches to us from John 17, verses 20 to 26. One of the great psalms that have been an encouragement to me this year has been Psalm 23. It's a psalm we know very well. It's coming up on the screen now. I'm going to read it to you. And as I read it, just rejoice in your heart and mind about the Lord who is your shepherd. Uh, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. We rejoice even more than King David rejoiced when he wrote this psalm because we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our good shepherd through the Holy Spirit. So let me read this psalm and let us rejoice in our hearts as we hear it. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise be to God for Jesus. Well, having read and uh, looked at Psalm 23 together, we're going to hear our musicians sing to us a great uh, hymn from the days of the Evangelical Revival in the 1700s. John Wesley translated this hymn from German into English, Jesus, Your Blood and Righteousness.
we've been reminded of those great gospel truths in that hymn, we're going to come before our Heavenly Father now and confess our sins with this prayer on the screen. So let's join together in this prayer of confession before we come to bring our further requests before God. Together, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you made all things and you call everyone to account. With shame we confess the sins we have committed against you in thought, word and deed. We rightly deserve your condemnation. We turn from our sins and are truly sorry for them. They are a burden we cannot bear. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all that is past. Enable us to serve and please you in newness of life, to your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has promised to forgive the sins of all who turn to him with repentance and faith, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, strengthen you to do his will, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in a few moments, I'm going to lead us in some further prayers, but I'm going to ask Ian to come up and just to update us about uh, our dear brother Murray, uh, who has undergone surgery yesterday, and then we're going to lead in prayer for those who are ill. Thanks, Mark. The good news is that Murray has come through his operation well, and uh, the doctors are pleased with what is going on and I had a call from Myra yesterday afternoon uh, to say that he's resting comfortably and then at nine o'clock at night I had another phone call from an excited Myra saying Murray's got on the phone and he's rung me and he wants to say to the people at Sylvania Anglican thank you for your prayers I'm doing well and um, looking forward to a good recovery so thank you for your prayers and keep, please keep praying for Murray and Myra. Thank you very much, Ian. And during this last week, our sister Lorraine uh, had some heart surgery uh, at Sutherland Hospital and uh, she's recovering very well. She has some further surgery coming up in the next couple of days, but she is uh, recovering very well from that uh, unexpected surgery this last week. But let me lead us in prayer for those in special need within our church and parish. Then I'll be leading in prayer for Anglicare and Anglican Aid, and uh, then we'll be praying together for uh, the residents of Sylvania Waters here in our parish. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you that you sent your Son Jesus into the world to demonstrate your great love for us. We pray this morning for all those in our church and parish who are in special need. We pray that you would look with mercy upon the grieving, the sick, the homeless, those enslaved by various addictions, and those encountering other forms of difficulty. Comf comfort and relieve all those who are afflicted and distressed and by your Holy Spirit, strengthen all who minister to them. We pray also for those in our church who are in special need. We pray for Murray and for Myra, for Lorraine, and for others that are known to us. We ask that you would relieve them of any discomfort or any anxieties or concerns they might have. We ask that you'll be with those who are caring for them and we pray that they would continue to know the love of their brothers and sisters in Christ and we ask these things in Jesus name Amen Almighty God creator and preserver of our world we thank you for our nation of Australia and we thank you for our nation's abundant wealth and prosperity given from your generous hand we pray today for the work of Anglican Aid and Anglicare. 
We thank you for the rich opportunities we have to share our financial resources in support of their word ministries, development projects, disaster relief and other caring activities in Sydney and throughout the world. We thank you for the partnership our church has with Anglican Aid and the Miracle Schools Project in Pakistan. And we also thank you for our partnership with Anglicare as we approach the Christmas season. We pray that you will use our clothing bins and our Toys and Tucker campaign to alleviate poverty and to provide hope in the midst of desperation. We ask, Lord Lord, that you would strengthen the ministries of Anglicare and Anglican Aid, especially during this year that has been marked by COVID-19. We ask that you will use their ministries to effectively help those in particular need who have been impacted directly by this virus. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray for the residents of Sylvania Waters. Heavenly Father, we do pray for the men, women and children who live in this suburb. We ask that you would have mercy upon them. Help them not to place their hope in the things of this world, but to trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. We ask that you would help Christians who live in that suburb to be strengthened and enabled in their witness to their neighbours by word and deed. And we ask that residents will come to know Christians and know Christ your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm now going to invite you to pray a prayer uh, in regards to our financial partnership and the monies that will be given today for the work of the gospel. Let's join in this prayer together. Gracious God, all things come from you and you teach us to be generous with what we have. We pray that our gifts may be wisely used for the ministry of the gospel and the relief of those in need for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, uh, once again, uh, we're privileged to have Adam Johnson ministering God's word to us this morning. Uh, before Chinzia reads from the scriptures and Adam brings us God's word, we're going to stand together and affirm our faith in this uh, creed, in this short creed. So please stand with me. Let's say this together. We believe in one God who made us and loves all that is. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was born, lived, died and rose again and is coming to call all to account. We believe in the Holy Spirit who calls, equips and sends out God's people and brings all things to their true end. This is our faith, the faith of the church. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. And Chinzi is now going to bring us our reading. Today's reading comes from John chapter 17, verse 20 to 26. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their, through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, 
may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you that you have sent me. I make known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Chin, and good morning, everyone. In case you don't know me, as uh, Mark said, I'm Adam Johnson. I'm one of the student ministers uh, at Sylvania Anglican Church, and it's a pleasure to be opening up John chapter 17 with you all. Let me pray to begin with, and then we'll have a look at what God is saying to us. Kind Father, thank you so very much for your word. Thank you that you have given it to us and you have taught us of your son, Jesus. Please shape us by your word and help us to be people who carry out your mission. Amen. Well, what is our purpose? This is a rather deep question that uh, many people, many great thinkers throughout the world have uh, worked hard at answering. And it's one that's plagued young and old alike, whether you're... Uh, can remember being young, as uh, I find hard to remember sometimes, and you've just finished high school, you've got all this time ahead of you, and you're thinking to yourself, now what do I do? Or you're uh, closer to retirement, or you have retired, work is behind you now, and you're thinking to yourself, with all of this free time, well, now what? Or at uh, my current life stage, you're going through work, or you're going through uni, uh, every day you've got to get up, you've got to have your breakfast, you've got to go to work, you've got to do your chores, you've got to buy the groceries... You're just going through the drudgery of life, but for what purpose? I think the uh, Christian version, of, actually, of this question is, what does God want me to do? What's God's will for my life? And you might be waiting for, say, a sign from heaven or something like that, or a special word from God to tell you that this is what he wants you to do. But the good news for us, actually, is that we don't need to guess God has told us. And in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26, in Jesus' closing prayer, we get a magnificent glimpse into the mind of God and we hear what Jesus wants us to do, what he wants for us. What does Jesus want for us? Jesus wants us to be united to God. And that brings us to our first point, our unity to Jesus today is through the Apostles' word. So Jesus is praying. He's done that throughout all of John chapter 17 so far. And he's praying in front of an audience, his apostles, the, his closest followers. But we see in this part of his prayer that Jesus has in mind not just his current audience, the apostles. It's like as if Jesus is gazing down throughout history and he's looking at the whole church even to us sitting here this morning listening to this. Have a look at verse 20 with me. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their work. Now, do you see how we're drawn into this prayer also? Jesus is not just praying for the apostles, but for all who will believe in him, in Jesus, through their work. Well, what is the apostles' work? Put it simply, the Apostles' word is their testimony about Jesus. You see, the Apostles who are currently in our passage listening to Jesus pray, in the next few hours after Jesus finishes praying, they're going to see Jesus crucified and die. And then three days after that, they will see Jesus alive again, risen from the grave. And they're going to have the wonderful joy of spreading that news. This is their word. It's their testimony. It's the gospel. Jesus is alive. And the gospel that we hear today is the same gospel that the apostles had the joy of spreading. It's the same word. And by believing in this gospel, we are united to each other and to God. This means that if you have heard the gospel and believed, Jesus beautifully includes you in this prayer. 
But what does Jesus ask for you? What is he asking God for, for you? Have a look at verse 21. That they, that's us, may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you. Now, it's fair to say that all of us want to feel connected to something in some way. I mean, that's why some of us might put money towards things like Ancestry.com to sort of see where our family tree comes from. Or maybe why we're interested in history. Now, last year, my wife Chinzia and I, we went to Port Arthur in Tasmania. And it's a really, spe it's a really special place. I highly recommend it if you've never been there before. Uh, and as you walk through the ruins of that old prison, uh, I think it's one of the first prisons in Tasmania, you get a, a real sense for who the first settlers of Australia were, the first European settlers, what they were like as people. But the thing is, as you walk through that place, you don't really feel connected to those people, or at least I didn't feel connected to them. But our unity with God is much deeper than just pages of history or writings in a book or something like that. Our unity with God uh, is like that of Jesus and his Father. By believing the in the gospel, we are invited, invited into unity with God as he dwells in us currently by his Spirit. See how Jesus talks about that unity? What does he say? He says, you, the Father, are in me and I in you. They are united. And we heard a bit about this relationship before, earlier in our sermon series, in John chapter 14, verse 23. And this is what Jesus says there. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now this brings us a great assurance today because we are 2,000 years removed from the events that are recorded for us in the Gospels. But brothers and sisters, that doesn't matter. We are as united to God today as the original hearers of the Gospel were 2,000 years ago, even to the apostles who saw Jesus face to face. They are our brothers and sisters in the Gospel. Time and geography do not separate us. They do not separate the church. And this leads us to our second point. Because of our unity to Jesus, we are loved. You see, the unity that Jesus has given us to God and to each other in the gospel is strong. Because it's based on God's love. Listen to how Jesus speaks about our closeness in the passage. It's, it's actually really quite intimate. It's in verse 23. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Now, earlier in his prayer, Jesus asked the Father to glorify him with the glory that he had before the world existed. That's in verse 5. We heard about that last week. And Jesus' glory there is as the one and only begotten Son of the Father. The union that Jesus has with his Father is one in which they are both glorified because they love each other, through their love for each other. Now, at this point... I think it would be helpful for us to pause and to give a quick definition of love. In our world, most people think of love as an emotion. And you can see that in the way that our world talks about love. Just think of any romantic movie that's been in the cinemas in the last five years or so. Or uh, maybe even the catch cry of the recent plebiscite, love is love. As if what love is should be obvious, you know, it's our feelings of affection or our feelings of desire towards one another. That's what our world says love is. But the Bible describes love very differently. The Bible describes love as an action, an action that you take on behalf of another person, even at great 
cost to yourself. That's what the Bible says love is. And this is what Jesus has done for us and for God. Earlier in John 17, Jesus begins his prayer saying that he has glorified the Father. That's in verse 4. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the the work that you have given me to do. Now the work that Jesus has accomplished is his obedience to the Father, showing the world who the Father is, showing the world who God is, and ultimately dying on a cross in our place, in obedience to the Father. Jesus did this because he loves the Father and he loves us. But now, in this part of Jesus' prayer, towards the end, we see that he has given us the glory that he had as well. His giving us this glory is like drawing us, inviting us into a family relationship with the Father. Jesus is the one and only true Son of the Father, but through him, we become adopted brothers and sisters in Christ with him. Way back at the very beginning of John's Gospel, in John chapter 1, he wrote about this, and this is what he says there in verse 12. But to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In fact, Jesus says that this is what his purpose was, as he finishes his prayer, thinking about his love for us. Have a look at verse 26 with me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. You see, Jesus wants us to be united to God, and because of our unity to God through Jesus, we are loved. Think about that for a second. It's beautiful. We are loved. And it's Jesus' last prayer in the Gospel of John before he goes to face the cross that we would be loved. And what's more, God has said yes to this prayer. Yes. The proof that God has said yes to this prayer is that in the very next hours, after finishing this prayer, Jesus is on trial then he is crucified and he dies in our place for our sin so that we could be loved. Remember Jesus' own description of his death. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And the Apostle John's own reflection of what Jesus did on the cross in his letter, 1 John, chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In Jesus we have the love of God. And this love is like that of a wonderful father with his arms open wide, ready ready to embrace us. That's what his love is like. Brothers and sisters, Jesus came to die for us on the cross. And because of this, this is God's will. That's why he died on the cross. This is God's will. It's God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. that leads us to our third point. Our unity to Jesus gives us a mission. Our unity to Jesus gives us a mission. See, one of the unfortunate things that people often say about John's Gospel, and it's not true, but one of the unfortunate things that people might say is that John's Gospel isn't very missional. You see, at the uh, end of um, Matthew's Gospel, for example, we have the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. But John, as he writes his gospel, he does have mission in mind. 
and Jesus certainly prays for it. You may have noticed that as we've explored this closing prayer that we've jumped around a little bit and we've um, skipped a few parts of the verses here and there. But that's because as Jesus prays, there's a certain sort of pointy end to what he's asking about. Have a look at the end of verse 21 with me and listen to what Jesus says the purpose for our unity is. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. And again, the end of verse 23. So that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. You see, the purpose for our unity is actually to reveal the love of God to the world. Our unity in Christ is missional. The love that God has poured out onto us is to flow within us as we love each other and from us out to the world at large. And if we could characterise God's love shown to us in Jesus, it is other person-centred. See, we are recipients of this other, other person-centred love and we should express that to the people around us, certainly to each other as well. But here though, as we seek to go about doing this, we can make two, two dangerous mistakes and they are closely linked to each other as well. The first mistake is to think that, in, is that to love each other or to love other people is to agree with them, to agree with everything that they're they're talking about. And see, that's what the world meant as it championed its slogan, love is love. Agree with me. Tolerate me. Don't challenge me on anything. That's what the world meant by saying that. But friends, tolerance sounds good, but it is such a low bar compared to love. Tolerance is all about let me be me, let you be you, you stay over there and I stay here. But love is all about seeking the benefit of the other person. So that leads us to our second mistake. And that is that thinking that all we need to do then to love other people is to do good things. But friends, this will not work. Because our loving actions, and we should do good things, but the good things we do, our loving actions, must be backed up by words. As a church, we are to share God's word with each other and with the world. We have the words of God, the Bible. The single most loving thing we can do for each other is to speak the gospel. I will be forever grateful for a brother that I have who after I had sinned and confessed this sin to him, the first words out of his mouth were, Adam, Jesus has paid the penalty for your sin. He went to the cross and died for you and God loves you. I will be forever grateful for that. And the world needs to hear this. The world needs to hear that it is in very real danger for rejecting God, but that through repentance and faith, there is forgiveness and love. Make no mistake, the world desperately needs to hear this, even if it thinks it doesn't want to. Have a look at verse 25. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, and now Jesus gives the answer, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus talks about continuing to make God's name known. This is not a one-time Rather, through our speaking the gospel, our speaking the Bible, Jesus will continue to make God's name known. And, the, yeah, the primary way that we do this is by sharing the Bible with each other. So keep speaking God's words. Read God's words daily. 
make it so make it that you know these words so well that it just becomes natural for you to speak the Bible. And the other reason we want to do this is because this is how we carry out our mission. When visitors come to our church, or we find ourselves out in public, maybe with a non-believing friend, or you're at work with non-believing colleagues, what a wonderful opportunity you have to speak the words of life. What a wonderful opportunity that you have to speak the gospel. You see, the gospel is what we have to offer. It's what makes us unique. And it's what we have to show that we are truly loved by God. Now, I'm not saying that the Bible is the only thing that we can talk about. But what I am saying is that if we don't talk about the Bible at all, then that is a real problem. If we're not going to share the gospel, that is a real problem. The world will not know the love of God unless those who have been loved by God speak about it. Brothers and sisters, through Christ we are united to God. Through Christ we are loved by God. It is Christ's desire and what he prays for that by our loving one another, and our love for God, that we would spread the name of God. That the world will come to know the glorious name, the glorious name of Jesus. And so come to also know God's love. Brothers and sisters, this is our purpose. Brothers and sisters, will you join in, in this mission? Let me pray. Kind Father, we thank you that you have loved us and that you sent your Son to save us. We praise you, Father, that you have given us the words to speak and that you have adopted us into your family as brothers and sisters and that we are truly united to each other. Father, in our unity, help us to love each other in such a way that the world will see and take notice. And Father, please give us courage, the strength, and the opportunities to speak your word so that we can make your love known to the world. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Adam. And our next song, our next hymn, which our musicians will lead us in, uh, is a song that helps us to reflect on some of the themes of love and of God dwelling in us and we dwelling with God through Christ. And so our singers are going to sing as we listen and ponder what we've been taught from God's word today.
come now to share in the Lord's Supper together. And the Lord's Supper, of course, is a symbolic meal for Christians as we remember not only the fellowship we have with each other, but the fellowship we have with God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we look forward to his return as we remember what he's done for us through his death and resurrection. So I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then we're going to, uh, I'll ask my assistants to come forward and to help to distribute uh, the bread and non-alcoholic juice. And if you're watching on Church Online, you may like to have your bread and juice ready too to join with us if you're a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that on the night before your son died, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine, and pray that we who eat and drink them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, believing our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. Amen.
who come to eat the bread together, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. drink the juice together. Drink this in remembrance that Christ shed his blood for you and be thankful. Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, in your loving kindness, accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, that brings our time almost to a close this morning. Uh, please continue to be praying for each other and praying for our nation and our society and our world at this time. Uh, please also be praying for those, as we've already done, for those who are undergoing particular difficulties at this time or illnesses or undergoing surgery or recovering from surgery. And uh, thank you once again for uh, transferring uh, your giving to uh, online. Uh, and uh, the details are on the screen there for those of you who need uh, details of our bank account so that um, if you can't uh, give online, you might like to take uh, your money, your giving to uh, a branch of the Commonwealth Bank where you can uh, deposit your cash giving there. Well, before I send you out in the name of the Lord, I'm going to uh, invite you uh, to join with me in our mission prayer. We've been reminded today from John 17 that our unity with God through Christ is a missional unity. And so let's pray this prayer together as we ask God to help us to mission together for him. Together, our gracious God, we pray that you will help us to proclaim our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that everyone around us will hear his call to repent, trust and serve Christ in love, and be established in the fellowship of his disciples while we await his return. May we continue to pray, to depend on your Holy Spirit, and to glorify you. Well, once again, friends, thank you for your cooperation uh, at this time. As you leave, um, please um, uh, try not to mingle out in the courtyard. Keep moving straight out the doors and uh, to your vehicles uh, because we can't mingle in the courtyard or even outside the front gates of our church at this present time. I'll keep you updated in weeks to come should there be any changes to uh, the public health order. But at this stage... Thanks so much for your cooperation as we seek to witness to the community around us as we're a COVID safe church. So I'm going to ask uh, these two sections here in front of me to leave first. So if you'd like to leave first, friends.